Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Lisa Russell, and I work as a filmmaker, but I actually never went to film school. My journey started a long time ago when I was an undergraduate, and I don't know if many of you can relate to this, but I was stuck in this dilemma of wanting to do something a little bit more creative. I had played music, I painted, and I was actually in a hip-hop troupe. Or to do what my mother wanted me to do, which was to get a real job, and I wanted to help people, so I wanted to become an ER doctor. And I did what probably any young person who's having an existential crisis would do. I freaked out a few times. I ditched my secondary applications, packed up my car, drove cross country to Boston, met an amazing global AIDS pioneer by the name of Jonathan Mann, ended up getting my MPH, and then landed my first job in uh, Kosovo and Albania working during the war. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but it was there when I was working in Kosovo and Albania that I really witnessed the power of media and both in terms of how it was helping development efforts, but more often how it was hurting what we were doing. Because the war that I was working in and the people that I was meeting was so very different than what I would see on the news. And what was the most profound experience for me was when I was at the US Embassy, and um, there were a group of women who were from both Albania and Kosovo who were doing great work in the camps. And the women said, you know, we're really upset with the journalists who are coming into the refugee camps because they're really hell-bent on telling the story about rape as a tool of war. They're coming in, trying to grab women who've been raped to get them on camera. And they said, you know, not only are they being insensitive to what we're going through, but what we fear is that at the end of this war, we will no longer be remembered as Kosovar women, but as Kosovar women who've been raped. And that was really deep for me. And working in the humanitarian field, I thought, OK, well, maybe with my background in public health, I can tell these stories differently. So, so for the last 10 years, I've been working around the globe, mostly for UN NGO agencies, telling very pressing global health issues. A lot of people may know my work. Um, I did a film called Love, Labor, Loss. It was my first film back in 2004 on obstetric fistula in Niger. I did a film called Not Yet Rain about unsafe abortions in Ethiopia. I did a film called Youth Zones about the impact of war on young people in Liberia, Lebanon, Colombia, northern Uganda, and New Orleans. And they were really important stories for me to tell, but what they didn't tell is they didn't tell the other experiences I was having while I was making the films. They were very unidimensional. And when I'm traveling, I actually have a lot of fun. I get to meet interesting people. I dance. And, um, and I started really thinking about, you know, what kind of stories am I putting out in the world? I had friends from Africa who were like, why do you come here and make a film about Africa and only show the bad parts of Africa? And I said, fair enough, but how do I tell a story about maternal health condition without showing the suffering of the women who are, who are dealing with this condition? I can't make a film about women living with obstetric fistula who are smiling all the time because that's not the reality of what this condition looks like. So I really came, you know, I got caught in a kind of a career crisis. And um, I, oh, sorry, I never wanted to be that person, right? And I definitely didn't want to be the butt of a Saturday Night Live skit. I don't know if you guys have seen this, it's hilarious. Um, but in 2014, I spoke at the first Social Good Summit on the power of film. And I was asked to talk about how my filmmaking was very powerful in raising awareness about maternal health issues. But what I started to ask instead was, OK, if film is so incredibly powerful, who has the right to make these films? I had no training officially as a filmmaker. I learned the craft on my own. I go through you know, serious consent processes. But in terms of the films that I make, there's no regulations. So what I've realized over time is that when I make a film, I have to recognize that I have a sense of privilege making these films because there is an inherent imbalance of power between people who are storytellers and, and the people whose stories we are telling. Um, there's a lack of monitoring or regulatory systems to ensure that the films are really adequately portraying the lives of the people that we're filming. Um, and there's a, you know, it's really difficult to talk about this power imbalance when I'm making films for humanitarian reasons. But the reality is, like, anybody can pick up a camera and go film, make a film about Africa. We've seen it. 
I mean, this has been a problem. You talk to a lot of the Africans here who will say we're tired of seeing the same narrative told about our country, our continent, over and over and over again. So I came across, I really was about to commit career suicide. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I'll just make music videos because I don't want to keep perpetuating these bad images because it's not how I walk through the world. I don't see people in pitiful situations. I genuinely like to help people and I feel inspired by the people that I meet. So I came across this really interesting um, charter which is set up like a UN charter of storytelling rights that was done by a researcher in Australia. And it, you know, the first article is, is really important. Everyone has the right to define their experiences and problems in their own words and terms. There's eight articles. I like this one. The person is not the problem. The problem is the problem. And so there are seven articles. You can Google it um, or I'll post it on Facebook. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, and what it did is it led to my wanting to tell a story differently. So when I ran the, uh, the cinema corner at the Women Deliver conference in Malaysia a few years ago, um, I got approached to make a film about girls' education in Guatemala. And I said, I will make the film, but I'm not making a sad documentary. I'm not making another film like this. So I had the creative license to go ahead and do it completely different. And what I ended up doing is I ended up, instead of focusing on the lack of education for girls in this particular area of Guatemala, I focused on a story about two girls who challenged their mayor to bring better care better health care and better education services to other girls in their community. And not only did I tell the story differently, I involved them in writing a script. So I didn't even do a documentary. I did, I guess, what's called a docudrama. I involved them in writing the script. They played themselves in the film. I added animation on both sides of it. And I told the story from them being adult women who were getting an award at a fancy award ceremony. And then when it flashbacks to you know, her explaining her journey, we see them in real life and, the, and reenacting sort of what they, what they did. So I'm gonna just show like a, one scene um, from Poder. Every day after school, I would look forward to meeting with my dear friend Elba. We would meet next Is to the calendar outside our school and talk for hours about all the interesting things we had learned about that day. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien, ¿y tú? Bien, ¿cómo te fue la escuela? Elba was three years older than me, so I was always excited to hear about the subject she was studying, and I'd ask her endless questions. Maestro nos puso a leer la Constitución. Pues a mí me interesó esto. Ah, derecho de la independencia. One boy in particular, Hector, was always teasing us about our commitment to our education. Okay, so that is, oops, sorry, I, where are we? Okay, I think I clicked it, sorry, Poder, Poder. Okay, anyway, so, so I made this film, and I don't know if you could tell, but we had kind of a lot of fun making it, and what I realized my learning experience for making this film is that the production process of making that film became a girl's empowerment exercise. They become sort of heroes in the community. Their mothers started talking about, like, why are they doing this, you know, peeking out of the houses, like, waving, like, what is going on? The media caught wind of what the story was. They wrote up about the girls, and they became the stars of their own community. And it was just a really fascinating experience um, making the film. They got to be there for the, the premiere. It's in Spanish. They got to see the premiere go on a red carpet, you know, and really be honored for the great work that they did in their community instead of it being focused focused on how many girls didn't go to school and how many girls got, you know, had early pregnancies. And this was, again, just a really um, important lesson for me because we're at a time when I think we need to start changing the narrative of the development stories that we tell. Um, people are tired of the exploitative pictures. Poor women smiling is not the answer, right? 
But if we want to tell girls that they are powerful, we need to stop telling stories that they are marginalized. Because I think on a massive level, if we can create mass consciousness that this world needs to be a more equitable, better place for girls, for example, then they are going to pick up on that. And involving them in the storytelling of their real lives, I think, is an interesting way to, um, you know, to go about that. So, so in changing the narrative, so this is my, my talk that I give a lot is on narrative justice, storytelling rights, and sort of the importance of changing the narrative. And what I've been doing is I've been looking at some of the work that you guys are all doing in the innovation and, and creativity sectors and noticing that when stories are based on technology, they seem to focus more on the solutions instead of the problems. You've heard of the soccer ball that stores kinetic energy when kids play with it. It's an amazing story. It's not focused on the poor kids in Africa who don't have electricity. It's looking at, oh wow, look at how amazing that these young people can be involved in transforming uh, what's happening at their community level. The other thing is that I work with a lot of artists. I have since the beginning. When I launched my Love Labor Loss film in 2004, I went on tour with Zap Mama around the country in a tour bus with a band and stopped off at every show that, uh, city that she had a show and did a screening during the daytime. I've worked with hip hop artists and I work with a lot of poets. And one of the things that I realize is that these sort of socially conscious artists, um, when they tell stories, they don't focus on like charitable stories to evoke pity. It's more of like, these are not right. This, these things are not right. It's more justice-based. And when you focus, when you shift the, the, the focus from charity to justice, the outcome is differently. You're promoting empowerment. And so I have um, started a new initiative, sorry guys, <laughs> called I Sell the Shadow. And it's really intended to create more meaningful and sustainable partnerships between artists and UN agencies. A lot of artists feel like they're looked at token entertainers, but can you imagine a world where artists are actually sitting in these you know, UN conferences where policy is being um, developed and they have you know, something, something to say about it? Um, I'm also developing a new entertainment portal because a lot of people say I'm so sick of what's out there right now. I don't want to hear any more Taylor Swift. I don't care about Justin Bieber. What if we had a go-to site where there are poets and there are musicians who are actually putting out positive, you know, beneficial, creative content, and we can go there to, um, we can go to the site and the portal will allow every story to support both the artist and the cause. So I'm sort of developing that. Um, I am going to, I think my next slide is a video, right? So I'm going to actually quickly show you um, a poet. I know poetry has been kind of a common theme here, but it's a 19-year-old poet that I work with. I'm a teaching artist at a great nonprofit in New York City called Urban Word NYC. And um, they're, I'm working with them to bring sort of global issues into their space. And so we work together for him to create a poem about climate change, which I think is really beautiful. So this is my poem. It's called The Mother's Cry. Somewhere close, a woman's hands are shaking like a tantrum under California's feet. I can feel the sea level beneath her eyes rising like a temperature. This warm body of water sitting on the edge of her sight, still as the calm after a flood falls like an empire. Tears run down her face like wildlife out of a burning habitat. Her lungs, two volcanoes sleeping under a blanket of white smoke. She screams in a voice made of ashes, how enough to peel the skin off the sky she stretched out. Hair gray as a rain cloud in a hurricane. Her voice is a loud bang in the night. Her lungs, two volcanoes sleeping under a blanket of white smoke, and, and, and it's dark. All the time. She has a landfill sized hole in her heart. I can smell the methane walking out of her pores, like an alcoholic walking into the living room. Body covered in bruises only in man made, she cries every day in a greenhouse. And if you ask her how to stop, she'll tell you. Ride her bike. And hold my hand with the lights off. Pick those poems up off the floor. Don't throw them away. Finish them. Use them over and over and over and stop moving so fast. You're gonna miss everything I made for us. Don't take me for granted. Treat me as well as I treat you. Treat me like you treat your mother. Like I'm the only one you'll ever have. Thank you, Yeah, he's right. 
Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up real quickly to tell you, um, I also, my career choice has been not, it was never planned, it's just sort of happened because I was really passionate about all the things that I kind of jumped into, and good things came about it. In 2009, I won an Emmy Award, and I told you I had not actually been formally trained as a filmmaker, and I actually don't make films for television. Um, even though I didn't become an ER doctor, I spent a lot of times in hospitals and healthcare clinics, so I get to experience the medical field. And in 2002, I ended up dancing with P. Diddy and Usher and Busta Rhymes and Pharrell at the video, MTV Video Music Awards. So it's sort of like everything sort of came together in the way that it was supposed to be. And for those of you who are still trying to decide what you want to do or where you're headed, um, I just want to end with this poem um, that I love. It's, uh, I don't know who said it, um, but it's, <laughs> come to the edge, he said, we can't, we're afraid. Come to the edge, he said, we can't, we'll fall. Come to the edge, he said. So they came, and he pushed them, and they flew. So, thank you.